on my Travel Wins podcast today is Dr. Nee Darko. How are you today, Nee? I'm doing really good, Peter. Thank you for having me on the show. Really excited to be here. Uh, Nee, I'm, I'm so excited in so many different ways to talk to you finally. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a few months in the making, but you have such an interesting and, and I think it just enticing story for a lot of people to listen to. Um, uh, give my listeners a little bit of your background that I know of. You're, you're a trauma surgeon, yeah. which which in most people's books, that's enough. You made it. You did it. You succeeded. <laughs> you know, you've, you've, hit, you've reached the plateau. You did the, the schooling. You, you, you put out the money. And then you decided to start your own podcast. And... And you, you got out of debt. You, you, you know, you're really a renaissance man in a lot of ways because you're you're a first generation immigrant uh, from Ghana. Um, what am I missing? What fill in the blanks for my listeners? What have I missed? <laughs> you cut. You pretty much got it all. Wow! I got to stop putting out enough you know, all this information on my podcast. <laughs> well, hey, if you listen to your podcast. I wouldn't hear it all. No, I appreciate. I really appreciate it. No, but, you know, thank you very much. Um, I, I think you pretty much got the gist of it. I'm just going to just take it all the way back, but I'm going to go really quickly through it because I think you basically hit the gist of it. I'm just going to fill in some things. But basically, sure. you know, I'm just a kid from New York City. I grew up in Queens, New York. Um, both my parents uh, were immigrants from Ghana, West Africa, you know, right next to Togo, um, not too far from Nigeria. And they came, my dad came in the late 60s and my mom came shortly afterwards. But I grew up in New York City. And, um, you know, grew up watching TV. I have three older sisters and um, just a typical kid, just, you know, wanting to do more and, um, you know, watch TV, you know, and live not too far away from Shea Stadium. So I was, you know, really big into the, the New York Mets when they were big in, you know, 1986. And I remember literally when they G- won. Gary Carter. Like, and, yeah. Yep. Gary Carter, Mookie Wilson, literally from yeah. where we live, the apartment complex, you can look around the corner from the building, literally. Look and you can see Shea Stadium. So when um, you know they were winning and celebrating, everybody. I remember I lived in this apartment complex called Left Rack City, basically the, you know like the projects basically. And you can see you know everybody on their balcony just screaming yeah. and just yeah. enjoy, and, and, and enjoying it. But the reason I bring that up is is you know despite you know the New York Giants also being at the top of their game in 1986 also. For me, you know I was watching TV and the thing that I was watching was you know the whole concept of Heathcliff Huxtable. Uh, on the Cosby show. And, you know, for me, I just loved his life. You know, he was a doctor, yeah. you know, his patients loved him. He had a great family life, you know, beautiful wife. And um, he lived in a brownstone in Brooklyn, you know, so that's really what I wanted in life, you know, despite seeing all these sports things, you know, constantly sure. on TV. Um, so I just, at that moment, I didn't really know anything about being a doctor. My, nobody in my family was in the healthcare field, except for my mom at the time. She was a nursing assistant. Um, and I just basically kind of set forth on this is what I wanted to do. And fast forward, you know, to being a physician, I, had, you know, like you said, jumped through all the hoops, got the credentials, did all yeah. these different things and kind of moved my life, you know, every four or five years to different parts of the country to kind of get the, the degrees. And once I got to that point, taking care of patients was great, but I just felt like there was more that I could do. Um, I felt like, you know, for me personally, um, you know, it was great to be Dr. Nidarko, but what made up Nidarko, really? You know, who yeah. who is he? And I felt like I had sacrificed so much of, like, my passion, so much of, you know, who I wanted to be in order to become this physician. So, you know, I literally decided to start my own podcast because when I was working, I don't know if, if the listeners know, but there's a type of work called temp agency for doctors, or it's called locum tenens. Basically, you're you work in rural or suburban hospitals that do not have, um, okay. you know, all the, the plethora of doctors that like a normal city would have. A lot of people yeah. don't know that. And as a result, they end up renting doctors, quote unquote, so to speak, for a short period of time. And that could be a couple of days, uh, literally to years. Um, so I did that at first because I just, you know, I just wasn't sure where I wanted to end up. And you signed these long contracts. And I said, you know, let me check it out first. And when I was doing all of these trips and, and meeting all these different people, you know, I was meeting doctors who were doing really think, really cool things that I just didn't know you can do, like being on TV, you know, yeah. writing for, you know, uh, you know, for certain news sources, being on TV and writing for Grey's Anatomy, you know, different <laughs> TV shows, Grey's Anatomy and so forth. I was like, man, I didn't know this, all this stuff existed. And at the same time, I was in a ton of debt. Um, I had racked up about 300 and 
$25,000 in student loan debt. I had married my wife. She, me and her went to the same medical school. We both got our MBAs at the same time as getting our medical degrees. So we both had the same amount of debt. Um, and I just wanted to start listening to podcasts um, that were about paying off debt. And while I was listening to it and just loving them, I was like, wait, you know, I, I want to check and see if there's any podcast about doctors who are just, you know, just doing things outside of medicine. I didn't see any. So I said, well, why don't I just try to do this as, you know, kind of a passion project and see what yeah. happens. And, you know, the rest is history. You know, it's kind of opened my eyes to so many different things. I, I completely appreciate what you, everything you just said. I, I mean, obviously, I didn't go to medical school. Um but being in sales and, and management for the last 30 years, you know, a, a lot of people look at me the exact same way. They're like, why are you doing a podcast? I'm like, mm-hmm. you're, you're the number one sales rep in, 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 for the company. I, you know, the president of the company called me. <laughs> I found out the power of LinkedIn really quick when I, when I oh, added yeah. the podcast host to my LinkedIn page. I got a call the next day from the president of the company I work for, for my day job, saying, do you still work for me? I'm like, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I've gotten three calls in the last 24 hours that, that you got a new job. What's going on? And I was like, oh, man, that's from LinkedIn. I go, no, I, I even put on there, you know, in addition to my job, I decided to just talk to other business travelers. But he's like, okay, that sounds cool. All right, just make sure you're still working for me, you know. But, uh. <laughs> It was the same deal. It's like why, people are like, "Why are you doing it?" I'm like, "It's it's the passion project kind of deal, you know." And right, it, it's. I mean, like, like you're, you're the you're that's the top level of of being a doctor, right? I mean, trauma surgeon is kind of known as the oh shit doctor. Like, when it goes well, bad. yeah. Well, I'd say right now nobody wants to see me. I'll tell you that right now. You know how everybody sends yeah. like. A- Ask it to their doctor, like their family medicine doctor, or you know their pediatrician or OB doctor. Like, yeah, I don't get that on Friday, no. on Christmas time. Like, nobody wants to see me. I'm the worst one. But in terms of obviously the acuity of people, yeah, I take care of people who've been shot, stabbed, car accidents, or if you need your appendix taken out, you know, in the middle of the night, that's me. I do all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know that starting a podcast is definitely not something that you would see a trauma surgeon do. And you still see that to this day. I mean, you see a lot of doctors right now who are on YouTube who are blogging, um, but you don't really see that many who are a surgeon, particularly trauma surgery or maybe even cardiothoracic or the heart surgeon who are actually blogging. So it kind of lets you know that it's really busy doing what we do, uh, but also at the same time I take pride in it because I'm really passionate about it. So I try to make as much time as I can, you know, even in between cases to record something. I'm with you. I, you know, it, it's like I, one of the things that came up in between was, do, you know, Dr. Pimple Popper. Yes, yes. You, you know, and, and the absolute world of success she's had outside of just being an esthetician, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's crazy when you really just, if you really love your craft and uh, and if you can, you know, properly, you know, make sure you protect patients' identities you know, you really can move far. I mean, the power of social media right now, it's ridiculous, right? Like the reach that people have now is something that, you know, I'm an 80s kid, 90s kid, like, (laughs) you know, if if you were to ask me back then, like, would people, you know, have as much success right now, literally from their phones? Uh, First of all, I didn't even know that phones would be this powerful, but it's amazing what what social media has done. I I talk to my daughters quite often. They're 23 and 25, both college graduates moving, you know, having their own jobs. And I, I try to explain to them now as they're, you know, older. I go, imagine trying to find a job when you didn't, if you didn't have a phone or a computer right. or internet. You would, I go, girls, you, you would literally walk door to door to try and find a job or you get the newspaper every morning and then make a phone call mm-hmm. or get a fax number and fax your resume over and then hope they call you back. Right now, right. I can now I can sit on my computer and on my phone while I'm sitting at a Starbucks and fill out a hundred, you know, put out a hundred resumes, and I can go yeah. on LinkedIn That's, and find out their background and everything else. So, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing it's awesome. what what technology has done. It's really accelerated a lot of things. I think really positively. You know, I'm really excited about what it's done. It, I really truly believe it's taken a lot of gatekeepers, quote unquote, if you know what I mean, yeah. out of the way and allowed you know the, the general public to really do things that we normally would never have any access to do. Well, I, you know, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast, and he was talking to 
I want to say it was Gary V, but it might have been somebody else. But he was saying basically, podcasts of the future. I mean, you know, growing up, because I'm, I'm I'm probably a little bit older than you, but I'm right around there. Um, you know, being being on the radio or, or having a show was, was inconceivable if, unless you went to school for it. Right now, right. here we are. You know, successful in our own fields and starting something outside of it. You know. It, as far as like, and, see, and, and and not to cut you off, but I just got to give you no. props for you being on the Lewis Howes show. Congratulations! Uh, Crazy. For that also. Yeah. I was listening to you on. I was listening, and I was like, wait, wait, is that the same Peter I know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, c- congratulations, man. That was awesome. It was. It, it, everything's kind of worked out, though. I had not listened to a podcast a year ago at this time. Really? Wow. So, I I, I ran into Gary B on YouTube. I mean, just just going through the the wormhole of, of YouTube, and stumbled upon him through uh, the Hot Wind Show, which is a YouTube you know eating mm-hmm. challenge show. Wings. Yeah. yeah. And so which I watched I him. To I need to be on that show. <laughs> I love the <laughs> game. I met him. I met Sean uh, at ComplexCon. Anyways, it, the whole the whole thing's about a year old. I, I, I ran into, I watched the Gary B episode, and I was like, "Who's this guy?" Started watching him. Met Gary V in February when he came out and did his raffle for his uh, crushing it shoe, and I won. I won a chance to win to buy the. T- you had to enter a raffle. You know, it was only giving out a hundred, selling a hundred pairs, and uh, so I won one of the tickets. So I got a chance to meet him. I bought his shoes. Uh, talked to him really quick, briefly, 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 and um, and then a few months later, he said, "You know, start your own podcast," and I'm like, "All right," and then. Talked to a guy in England on Twitter. He started his own podcast, and he had some success. I'm like, what the heck? Well, why not? So I started my podcast, and then uh, literally like maybe a month, month and a half later, I entered this contest of the Beyond Lewis House show, and I, I win that. So <laughs> I want your luck. <laughs> Let me my, rub my wife you keeps, give, me some, give me some of that luck. My wife keeps saying, keep playing the lottery. She goes, you are so lucky with, with that. I go, I'm winning what I'm supposed to be winning. I love that term. Yeah, I like that. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's I'm being given exactly what I need, which mm-hmm. was the support of, of Gary V and following him, and then meeting Sean Evans from Hot Ones at, at the Complex Con. He was there signing, and I was like, "Oh my God, I shot guys!" So I got so I got a picture with him real quick, and then being on Lewis Howe's show, and actually meeting the people behind his show. Uh, the videographer, the, the, he has a CEO, he has a, a personal assistant, he has a stylist. He, you know, he he's got, you know, he's he's doing it. And uh, and then meeting, you know, the other people that were on the show from ones from Dubai, ones from Canada, ones from Seattle. You know, he flew people in from around the world. And uh, yeah, it's just exciting just being on that yeah. actual show. Yeah, you almost made me get into a car accident when I heard that name. I was like, wait, the travel wind. I was like, I know that guy. I know Peter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so so he, he takes us to dinner that night, right? And uh, we go to this place called the Soho Club, which is a private dinner club. Very private. Like, we're going in there, and he goes, don't bring your phone out. He goes, you're not allowed to text. any. You're not allowed to take pictures. You're not allowed to take a phone call. Don't bring out your phone or they'll kick us all out. I go, okay. Really? There, there's industry people there. And uh, so we go, at, we're in West L.A., Beverly Hills, we're out the borderline. And it, if you ever get a good chance to go to the Soho Club, go. It's awesome. It's, it's indoor trees, and, and, I, and it's just beautiful in the atrium on the top floor of the okay. building. Well, can can us regular people get in there? Because the way how you describe it, it's like one of those secret-type clubs, man. Correct. It is. A, it's still a secret-type club, and Lewis House is a member of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, so he told us in and all that. So we sit down, and I look at the table right next to us, and it's LL Cool J sitting next to us. And like, Are you serious? Oh. I'm like, God damn it, that's LL Cool J, man. I've no, I mean, I'm like, come on. I know you're like, where's my phone? <laughs> uh, exactly. I'm like, I don't, and I never do that. Where, you know, cause I live in LA, and so I, I try really hard not to do that. But I'm like, that's LL Cool J. Anyways, and, and I, I remember, you know, Lewis saying, don't do it. And um, so uh, LL gets up. And walks by and says hi to Lewis. And I'm like, oh shit, okay. 
And uh, so he, he goes to the bathroom or wherever he was going. And uh, Lewis goes, yeah, I've been trying for three years to get him on my show. He actually follows me. And I was so surprised to see that he, act, that he followed me that we're just we're having such a scheduling problem. He goes, it's just a matter of timing. So I'm like, mm. okay. Yeah, so here's Lewis Howes, a top 100 podcaster. Here's the old cool Jane. They just It's the same way. It's three years, you know. And they know right, each other. They like how- each other. It's it's amazing. I mean, I to to see his his rise, you know, Lewis's rise, and to you know listen to his brand story, and then now for him to matter matter of factly kind of just describe, you know, his struggles trying to get certain guests and having to respect their time. I found it really fascinating. I'm sure it was really fascinating for you to kind of see or get a little glimpse into his life and to, you know, just see how well and how far he's made it, but still, you know, struggle struggles every now and then to even get like really top notch guests. It's 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 very interesting, I think. Well, yeah, and, and I, I thought the exact same thing where I was like, you know, it, it the struggle is real. I mean, you know, for getting guests and, and scheduling and timing and all that, and and that never goes away. That was one thing I picked up really quick, that no matter, basically no matter how big you are, because you always wanted to get, you know, someone else. I mean, his goal, I don't know if you heard it, was Kevin Hart and, and, and The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, and so everyone. LeBron, LeBron James on there also. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's a Cleveland guy. So, yeah. Yeah. And Lewis mm-hmm. is from Columbus. So, mm-hmm. so it, it was, it was, yeah, it was just interesting to, to see kind of behind the scenes. Like if you look at his office and he has uh, Matt, his CEO, uh, who the, the, runs a lot of the, the operational parts of it, uh, showed us around and just, it was just interesting to see that, that next level, even that next level, you still have issues. It never goes away. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah. and it's just like oh, yeah. your job now, just like my job. You know, I've been doing it for nine years. I still run into things I've never had happened before and all that. Same thing with the podcasting, you know, technical issues. And the, the thing I liked about your podcast was, I, I love the three, two, one podcast. So I should talk. You're also an author. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of, of, of the three, two, one podcast book, and that I think that's what a lot of people need. They need that book, and I'm going to try and put that link for your book in in, in the um, on my website and on the page because anybody that's interested in doing it, oh, but, dude, th- there's so much information that that I wish I would have known prior. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, yeah, dude, yeah. Some I things, agree with you. Some, some I things agree. just have to go through. Yeah, I think you have to go through that process, which is the same thing with me. I had to go through that process. And then you look back because people start asking you, well, you know, how did you start, you know, podcast? How did you start this portion, this portion? And you start answering it over and over again. You're like, you know what? Yeah. Well, I know that one of my weaknesses, for me at least, is I, I like to talk more than write, right? And being a physician, the majority of what I write, the majority of what I read is academic in nature. It's related yeah. to studies. It's related to different things. So it's really boring. So for me, when I write, I'm not going to lie to you, I write in a very boring fashion. It's very difficult for me to write how I talk, which I think a lot of bloggers who are very successful, they, they can do that very well. And I'm actually really jealous of that. <laughs> exactly. I struggle with that right? So that's the reason why I, I podcast is because I just, I, it's very easy for me to just kind of talk, you know, as opposed to writing it out. And I just decided, you know, that year that the book came out, that was going to be my year of failure. That was going to be my year that I threw everything at the wall. And I just said, you know what? Um, I'm tired of taking the safe route, right? Um, even though people say, well, what you do is really exciting or trauma surgeon and so forth. Like the path has already been laid to that, right? You go to school, yeah. um, you do training um, and that's it. You know, that's the way how someone became a trauma surgeon before, but this world of podcasting, this world of building your own brand, you know, it's, it's literally like being in space, right? It's just like this uncharted territory. So that's what I decided to do. I, I didn't know it was going to get re- well received and I appreciate you putting a link out there, but I do, and I'm sure you you agree that podcasting is the easiest way, I think, right now to get started with trying to build your brand or, um, or at least trying to just get in touch with people and, and rub shoulders with influencers or people who are really, you know, movers and shakers in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, the the I, my, my my daughter is blessed to have she's had very 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 cool jobs uh, while she was in college and now since she's been out of college. And with with very very famous people, and I always tell her, I go, <clears throat> don't forget you're the help, not the talent. And 
it, 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 what you know what Gary says a lot about you know being the the party host instead of the party guest. And that's that's kind of where I've taken you know the, the podcasting. I I've, I've talked to the to doctors that I've never would have talked to. I eat you, M- musicians, uh, athletes. That that why else would they want to talk to a guy that sells Western clothing and cowboy boots? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the the podcast you did. It was the uh, I forget her name. Um, the writer for the Grey's Anatomy. Yes, um, Zoanne Clack. Yes. Yeah. What a, what a phenomenal story, and it's 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 the yeah. same thing, you know, <clears throat> becoming a technical advisor, to not even having to be a doctor and just working full time on on a show that she's that she writes for or whatever. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. And and those those are the the, thing, the cool thing. You, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, what I was gonna say is that those are the things that nobody talks about these stories, right? You just finally like you you hear about these stories when like. It's like it's too late for you to make that type of decision, right? Right. That's where the frustration comes out, right? Like you become seventy, you're like, oh yeah, I've been writing for Grey's Anatomy for like the past twenty years. Like, wait, wait, what? (laughs) You know, that's what I'm trying to. I'm trying to prevent those type of uh, situations from occurring. Like, I didn't even know people did doctors did that. You know, so it's funny you brought that up. Oh yeah, you know, and and I think that's the cool thing about podcasting. You know, if I, the weirdest part for me was having somebody in Brazil send me a picture of them listening to to me in Portuguese on their car phone on their car. Are you and serious? It was, and it's in Portuguese. I'm like, oh my god, you know, like that's wow. Just, the, 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 I mean, the power of podcasting, you know. And it's I have friends in England that listen to my show, and it's just weird. It's like, why wouldn't you? I mean, if you have something to say, the the, the price is right. You know, you don't have to to uh, become a radio person. You don't have to. I mean, look at the opportunities you've had just since you. I mean, you're getting into kind of your business travel. I know you've traveled to Ghana uh, as a doctor and, and worked over there, um, and now you're traveling locally, even just for for seminars, for podcast things, and for for um, speaking engagements, which is, I mean, that's incredible. And even and even for work now. Um, so I've just I've really embraced like this this um, locum tenens as a yeah. traveling doctor lifestyle now, which is basically I'm an independent contractor. I'm, a, I'm not employed by any hospital, but I go and I work at various places. Um, definitely, when I was paying off the student loan debt, I had uh, I was employed I was an employed physician working in Pennsylvania, and the way I would work is I would work 24 hours in the hospital, take all comers. And then the next 24 hours, I would be off, quote unquote. But basically, that's the opportunity for me to catch up on any surgeries or uh, anything that I needed ups, to do yeah. that I couldn't do during those 24 hours initially. And I would do that for two weeks, alternating with, with another doctor. The next two weeks, I'd be completely off. And, you know, being early in my career and having all the student loan debt, I just could not justify staying at home and twiddling my fingers and just saying, okay, I'm just going to enjoy my two weeks off. I had to yeah. do something else. So, you know, me and my wife made a plan. I basically started traveling and going to different hospitals and, you know, increasing my skills, becoming a better surgeon, doing more cases. Um, but I'm not going to lie. It's another opportunity to bring in income. And what I ended yeah. up doing is, you know, I would travel to Idaho. I would travel to Min- Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota. I would travel all over the country, you know, learning different ways to pack and learning the, the skills of, you know, like rolling your clothes and, you know, what little, how minimal can I pack and how can I yeah. not have to check a bag basically. Um, but also at the same time, it was a great opportunity for me to pay off a lot of debt. The hardest time I think definitely was, there was about a good seven month period where for seven months straight, me and my wife literally only saw each other for two weeks out of the month. Right. Yeah. And um, that was really difficult because you're just like, well, you know, we're still a new, in a new marriage, you know, you wanted to develop you know, some connection and stuff, and then two weeks you're gone. Um, but, you know, we had a, you know, a bigger purpose in mind. We were able to get past that. But there was a point where my wife was like, I think you need to stop, you know, because, one, I was getting really stressed. I was not exercising. Um, and then also at the same time, you know, we just missed each other. So, Well, that's, that's always the, the, the work-life balance part, you know. And, like, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my, new, my new wife, um, you know, when 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 we met, I had the job I have now, which is traveling. So there was no, hey, I didn't know, and I think that's where where 
you know, you're a doctor. And I think that I don't think most, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Most people, I, I would think, think, oh, you're a doctor. You go to your office or your hospital and you work there. You go home and that's it versus the traveling part of it, you know, being the, the locum tennis. Uh, that, that's a whole different dimension to, to, to being a doctor, I think, that most people don't consider. And I don't oh, think yeah, a lot most... of people consider the $300,000 in debt either. Oh, yeah, yeah. So definitely doing being a, a locum tenens or uh, independent contracting is something that's still in a minority, right? The default uh, way that most people would think about their physician is either employed by, by a hospital or having a private practice. Yeah. Private practice is, is quickly dwindling. More and more hospitals are just eating up these yeah. private practices. Yeah. And um, these doctors are, are working, you know, in, in this in a contracted, you know, typical fashion. But I think definitely for me and I think for, you know, a growing amount of, of people, particularly younger physicians, is they're wanting to have more of a work-life balance. And I think they've seen – you know the generation in front of me. You know the doctors who who are been who've been out in training since maybe the late 80s and 90s. They've seen basically the loss of of that work life balance, the always being connected to a pager, the high divorce rate, the low yeah. or excuse me, the high amount of debt. They've seen all those different things, and they've said, "Yeah, not me, right? It's not worth and, it. And um, yeah. yeah, it's not worth it. And because of that, I think a lot more people have been embracing this." I want to control my destiny, right? Because they see it in other aspects of, of life, right? And other, other yeah. professions. And they're like, well, you know, I want to be able to control my, 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 uh, my destiny more. So I want to take this independent contracting route for a little bit and see how it goes. My prediction is that it's going to increase. There's going to be a lot more people doing it. I don't know exactly where the zenith is going to be, but I think you're going to, it's going to be a lot more, um, it's going to be a lot more ubiquitous, I think, in terms of people thinking of their doctors not as just um, a private practice doc or employed by the doctor, <laughs> hospital, but more of an independent contractor. That's an interesting – and I haven't looked at it that way, but you're right. <laughs> Excuse me. The um, – wow. The, the, the whole idea that – I think it's great for doctors. I don't know how it's going to work out with our, our – insurance practices that we have now in this country yeah that's that's the difficult part um that's the part that's going to be really difficult to manage um but i think just like in any other profession you know it's it's going to be a situation where I, you know it, without going too much into a tangent but basically i think you know starting in the 50s and 60s when you know medicare and then eventually medicaid started coming in basically um uh medicine that was controlled by the government and it has very a lot of positives so I'm not berating that at all. But I think what happened during those those times are do, the doctor got very um, – was willing to give too much of the way how medicine is managed to someone else and basically yeah. took the concern of, well, I, I just want to be a great surgeon or I want to be a great doctor. That's it. And it's like, well, you can't do that, right? You, it, you, have to take the, you have to take the good with the bad with the busy, right? You have to know how, you know, your meal is prepared in the kitchen, so to speak. And I think they gave away way too much power. And unfortunately, physicians are in a very precarious situation now where we really don't control, you know, a lot of different things like, you know, how patients stay in the hospital, you know, what we get reimbursed. And I think that a lot of people have learned from those mistakes and are starting to get more into, you know, the health policy, health legislature, and are really starting to realize that doctors, we do great things in the hospitals, but we can do just as much great things, you know, in Congress or in le legislature and definitely in society. Well, the one thing that also reminds me of is, and, and I talked to my daughters who, who, you know, they graduated in the last year and a half, two years from college. And one of the things they didn't teach them is, is like basic math, you know, uh, taxes, you know, how, how to run personal finances, that type of thing. And because uh, I had those, those talks with, with my one my oldest daughter, and she was like, God, I wish they would have taught this in class. I go, me too. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you spend that. that much money. And, and it, you know, lawyers, it's the same way. Uh, doctors, you know, as far as they teach you how to be a doctor, how to do your practice, but as far as the business end of it, the business world, they, they kind of don't, I, I would imagine. I know attorneys no. don't. 
No, no, they they don't do that in, in medical school. Um, and I don't know if you've gotten a chance, but if you look at some of the people who I've interviewed, some of the people who I've interviewed are people who are really saying, you know, these are things that, like you said, we should have learned in medical school, like how to, you know, balance a budget, how to write a check, how to yeah. negotiate, all these different things we never learn. And then all of a sudden, it's just the same way that people look at sports athletes. Like, how is it that you're making millions of dollars and then you end up bankrupt? And it's like, well, hold on, before you cast judgment, just remember, yeah. like, this person never had to write a check up until yeah. literally the day they got a million dollars or multiple million dollars. Then what do you expect? They don't know how to write a check, and you know they don't know how to balance a checkbook. They probably don't understand the basics of money. It's the same thing that you can apply to doctors also. Don't be – I always tell people, don't get it twisted. Like, the yeah. mistakes that athletes make are the same mistakes that physicians make and a lot of high net worth professionals make. Just, you know, I tell people, like, I was one of them. It's not that like we were spending a lot of money, but literally – we were living paycheck to paycheck, and it's a two-position household. Yeah, yeah. But no, you know, it, 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 that's so interesting because that's exactly that's exactly right. I always tell, you know, Johnny Manziel was, I think he's four or five months older than my daughter, my oldest daughter. And like, if you would have given my daughter at 22, 15 million dollars, you know. How, how how would you respond? How would anybody respond being that young, 21, right. 22 years old, given that much money, never had a job, you know, if you're, if you're a college athlete, I talked about that with some of the, some of the athletes I've had on, on the show. You know, Smush Parker who played for the, the uh, Lakers and Clippers and Cavaliers, played 16 years of pro basketball, you know, is now finding out about how to, how to you know, make money not being a professional basketball player after 16 years. Right. It's a tough right. it's a tough world, you know. It's to be like you not being a doctor anymore. Saying, Okay, you're you're too old to be a doctor. You have to retire. Right. Oh shit, what do I do now? You exactly. Know? And 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 you're in your the, the money earning portions of your life, right? Like you're not it's not like you're in a retirement age. Like you still have the next thirty, forty years of your life to make money. How are you going to figure that out? I always tell you, uh I I'm fifty one. And uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, Eric Karros played for the Dodgers. Yeah, uh, I remember. He's first baseman. Yeah, I went to high school with him. And, you know, so we're exactly the same age. And yet he's been retired now for 15 years, <laughs> you know? Like you're just getting started. <laughs> yeah, he's been retired for 15-plus years from his sport. You know, And he was a veteran at 35, 36 or whatever he was when he retired. He was a veteran, you know, 15 year right. veteran. I'm like, hold on, I, you can't retire. You retired at 36. What are you gonna do? You know, right. that's like a lot of these mm-hmm. guys. You know, so I think Smush is 39, um, and he's still trying to find find uh, pro pro gigs. You know, his last job was in Mongolia or Venezuela. Really? Wow. And okay. um, I t- yeah, I talked to him. He said. Uh, you know, he, he played he played six years in the NBA, and then he played ten years overseas. Played in Iran, played for Greece, um, Mongolia, and all these places. So I talked to you know the, the best place he he ever played at was Greece. He loved Greece. The beaches he said the beaches there were unbelievable. He said uh, the worst was Mongolia because it was so cold. And he's from New York, mm-hmm. born and raised in New York City. Right. Mm-hmm. And he said Mongol Russia was so cold that he ended up uh, hurting his back because he could never warm up. They don't have the same amenities in Russia that they that they do here in the States for when you play. He said he was just cold all the time, so his back really spasmed up. You know, you would never think that, right? It's like, you think, yeah, you just go and play basketball, unless it's, you know, negative 20 outside, so inside it's only 45 or whatever. So that that's the, that's the beauty of podcasting, and, you know. I, I just think it's cool that you're already traveling now for your podcasting. I saw the one um, you did the the one uh, speech at the Fix Eighteen, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Was- so feminine, yeah, feminine yeah. idea exchange. Um, that's that's the part that I didn't expect. So actually, the, the a little bit of a backstory. I just thought I would just continue to do my episodes, uh, you know, via a Zoom conference or by a conference call. It was yeah. until my wife actually pushed me. She's like, look, why don't you try traveling, you know, and meeting these doctors where they're at or meeting these people where they're at? And I was like, why would I do that? <laughs> She's like, well, but I thought 
you know, you wanted to kind of take the next step up. And I was like, yeah, that's actually true. And, um, you know, you just interviewing people and being open. And this kind of goes to sometimes you psych yourself out of opportunities. Um, I'm not the greatest public speaker. Um, I actually have a little bit of a fear of public speaking. Oh, you and did really after well, I in- Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> but <laughs> I fake it till I make it. And um, I interviewed her. So the name of the of the conference is called Feminem Idea Exchange or Fix, and then it's whatever year is attached to it. So this year yeah. is Fix 18. So I interviewed Dara Cass, Dr. Dara Cass. She created it. And at the end of the conversation, she's like, listen, I think you would be, you know, great to be on my show to talk about or to come to the conference to talk about, um, you know, how you were able to get out of your box and how podcasting has helped you. And, and literally as she's talking, I am trying to figure out so many different people that she could ask instead <laughs> of me. I'm dead yeah. serious. Like, I'm dead serious. That's how, how much I'm like, well, maybe she, she can't be talking about me. You know, it's, it's, I'm not the one. And then literally before she finished talking, I was, and it took her about five minutes to do her ask. And by the time she finished, I was just like, you know what, need suck it up. Like, this is what you need to do. And if you're never going to really get to another level unless you push yourself and be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And she said, hey, would you want to be on it? And I started saying, well, I think maybe you should. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Let's do it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, and since then, I've, I've, I've just been, um, at the point where I just, I'm very honest. I think that's the thing too of podcasting that I think obviously with you, you've been able to be very successful too is, you know, as long as you're honest with the audience and you let them know that, you know, look, these are, this is my show. This is what it's about. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. And I want you all to hold me accountable. I actually think that you end up getting a lot more success with that because people obviously are voyeuristic and you can tell by the way how real, you know, reality TV is just exploding like crazy. Yeah. Uh, but people want to connect with people who either look like them, um, who they can identify with, and then they're okay with seeing you succeed provided, you know, they see that transition from you maybe fumbling over your words over your first, you know, 100 podcasts to now, like, you're just, like, at the point where you're, like, interviewing people like Lewis Howes or something like that. Like, you, you're taking them with you and you're building a community. Um, so that's how I look at it now is I'm very open and honest about my weaknesses, what I'm, what I'm fearful about. Sure. And um, with that approach, it's kind of helped me get more and more opportunities to speak about my podcast, speak about what I do. Well, like I said, I mean, your story is, is it's awesome. I mean, you're now traveling around as a doctor and as a podcaster. You're an author. And now you're a professional speaker by, by terms of being paid for speaking. You know, I mean, it's just interesting to me, like, if, if you if you were to go back 10 years ago in your life and said, you know, you're like probably going to be, a, I'm just going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a successful doctor and have a great life and a wife. And, yeah. and that, now look at all the things you get to put behind your name now. Yeah. Podcaster, yeah. business owner, an author, speaker, in such a short yeah. time. Yeah, and I, and I was... You know, Peter, I was that guy 10 years ago who, if you had told me all this stuff, first of all, I would have been like, why am I doing that? Like, yeah. obviously, I'm not doing, I'm not, there's something wrong, obviously, that I would have to do all these different things. Um, and, you know, I was that guy in college who, if you were to throw any type of business course in front of me, I would have been like, for what? You know, I'm going to be a doctor. Why do I need to know oh, that? Yeah, right? exactly. All these different mistakes, arrogance that I had back then, you know, and um, I look at myself now and, you know, I... I'm really happy that I was able to kind of allow myself to 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 kind of just step out of the box, so to speak, and kind of leave my ego behind because it's really taken me places that I never would have thought um, I would have been in. And, you know, just a little bit of some statistics, like being a trauma surgeon, being a surgeon in general, one of the highest divorce rates. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want to be estranged from my kids. You have children, so you understand that important relationship with you and your daughters, yeah. you know, so, you know, uh, or, you know, it's, just, you know, getting to a point where, like, you know, I'm in my 40s and just really missing out on, like, the last 20 years of my parents' life. Like, those are things that I just did not want to have. Um, and if I didn't take, you know, if I didn't go left or right or whatever way on, you know, on that proverbial fork in the road, you know, my life would have been a lot different. I, yeah, I've had it similarly. You know, I've always talked to my daughters about, you know, being your own person. You can do whatever you want. And then this opportunity came up, and you know, and you can either step up or not step up. You know what I mean? It's like, right. so I, I was like, I can't tell my daughters 
to be all these things that they're not just because they might believe it and then me not do it you know, for the same reason. Oh, I'm too old or I can't do this or, you know. And so <clears throat> completely out of my, my, my wheelhouse speaking to, like, speaking to people is fine. It's listening to my own voice, doing the audio editing, the posting, the public, you know, the publishing and all that. Totally out of my realm. The website that, but, you know. But you're making oh. yourself so much better for it. Like the Peter back then versus the Peter now, it's just like, you know. Totally different. You're badass. Yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's interesting because some, you know, the first couple of interviews I had were people I've known for years. And <clears throat> trying to go out and, and talk to people that I don't know but respect has been the, the challenging. And it's been exciting. Um, but it's been the, it's the challenge now, you know. Do you, do, you, do you ever struggle? Do you ever struggle with? Because I have that situation also. Like my first like five or ten episodes have been, even more than that, were people within my network, right? People who I know. Yeah. Um, but I still have that quote unquote fanboyism when I interview someone who's a big star, and I think that affects my interview. It affects my ability to be objective. It affects my ability to ask really hard questions. Um, do you ever suffer from that? Yes. And, and it's interesting. Um, my, my second podcast was with a guy named Cowboy Troy, Troy Coleman, and he's a, a country country music star singer. Um, has his own hip hop, rap kind of thing, and mm-hmm. you know, he, he, he performs with Big and Rich, which is a really big country western group. Um, he was the host on National Star, which was the American Idol for uh, CMT, and. Uh, so he's been on, he's been on TV. He's been you know he's performed around the world in front of literally hundreds of thousands of people. And I called him. I said, Man, I'm thinking about doing this podcasting. How do you what do you do to relax and before you go out on stage and all that? And he kind of gave me some tips and and you know to, to get really focused and, and centralized. Maybe listen to a, a, a relaxing song, but not too relaxed. You know. So he gave me some tips and all that because I was like I don't know what I'm doing. You know. I mean, I still the, the the most listened to podcast I have is the first one I've done, and I hate it. <laughs> I absolutely hate it, and uh, because there was no editing ability, it was I did it on Anchor, and it was it recorded and and posted it. And I was like, oh man. So and you I know what? Never, so your I, audience, your, but it's a great opportunity for your audience to kind of see your your um kind of like where you started off at. Start point, yeah. Now. Yeah, and and I know uh, my my first podcast was with Hunter Kier, who's a two-time world champ cowboy, and uh, he's got a new DVD coming out uh, for training. And so I said, when 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 your DVD comes out, I'm gonna have you on again so I can do a proper show with you. And um, so I'll, I'll have a, my my first redo when when he comes out with his CD, but and uh, or his DVD, and and because he's now asking me about social media, you know what mm-hmm. I mean. You're the go-to guy, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, hold on, I'm not the go-to guy, you know. But um, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. And and he's just he's doing the same thing. He's he's a cowboy. I mean, he's literally done this his whole life. He got his you know got his degree from the University of Texas in agriculture, and um, so he's a smart guy, college educated, has a cattle ranch, and um, but he's a professional. You know, he he rides a horse, jumps off the horse onto a, a steer, and wrestles it to the ground. And he has to do it in about four seconds. Wow. And if he if he does it at three point seven seconds, he's a multimillionaire. If he does it at four point two seconds, he's not a multimillionaire. So, you know, talk about pressure. Yeah. And uh yeah, that is yeah. So, you know, those are the people so I, I find when like I had Adam Trent on and I had Smush Parker on. You know, guys I I mean people I watched on T V, you know. And I kinda of fanboyed out. But then I realized, you know, after you talk to them, they're just like anybody else. It's, oh, yeah. I, for me, I have to go, okay, it's just like me talking to Hunter here. I mean, when Hunter, when we go to the rodeo and all that for my work, people stop him to get his autograph and take pictures with him. And to me, he's just Hunter here. He's just Hunter. You know what I mean? And, and Troy's yeah. the same way. Yeah, Troy will come and sign autographs. You know, we set up a booth at, at, in Vegas, and we – we set up a table and this, uh, he signs autograph slicks and signs hats and all that for fans that are coming by. And to me, it's just Troy. 
side. I didn't fanboy out over Troy or Hunter, but when I get Adam Trent or Swish Parker, and, you know, a knee Darko, you know. Oh, you know, please, come on. <laughs> you, kind of, you, you, get, you get a little bit more nervous, you know. So mm-hmm. it's it, it's been an absolute learning experience for for me, for hopefully my, my listeners, for, for everybody, you know. Your show's the same way. I mean, you're so smooth now. I, I did. I, I don't know if you heard. I don't know if it was on the Lewis t- uh, episode, but I told Lewis. I said it made me so comfortable for going back and watching your first Skype interviews, and saying this to Lewis. And he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Those were pretty rough." I go, "That's where I'm at." I go, <laughs> "You know, you're pretty polished now. You got a three camera setup, and you got lab mics, and you're on the HN. He's on. He's using the H6, and so you're like you're on the H4N. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's on the H6, and." Uh, so he has more output. And, you know, so I'm looking at the lighting and this and that, and I go, but I went back and watched his first couple of Skype uh, podcasts. So, I went, oh, okay. He was just like us. Yeah, exactly. Bad lighting, yeah, I think bad that, sound. I think that's that's the powerful part, too, of success, too, is to not be comfortable with, you know, just what you're doing, right? There has to be an iteration that you take your, your, or at least that your fans see you go through or your listeners see you go through. And, um, you know, I think it's really important. I've seen it on YouTube. I've seen it, obviously we're seeing it in podcasting right now. Yeah. Um, you know, we're doing it on our own. Like there has to be that, that, that change. Right. And that's what I'm doing right now. Like now I'm, I'm adding, you know, uh, a, a, a Friday component, you know, to, to my show where, you know, I'm just taking five minute snippets of conversations where people are talking about, getting over fear or overcoming uh, procrastination or insecurities and how they've been able to kind of push past that. And it's just another opportunity for me to kind of get content out there to um, my, uh, my sure. listener because I just was like, you know, I've been doing this for about two and a half years now. And I think now is the time really to kind of take things to a different level. And if I fail, then, you know, I fail, but at least I tried it. And, um, you know, I've seen it in, in, in YouTube. You see YouTubers who, like you said, you know, it, it, you, kind of parallel that experience, you know, with Lewis Howes interviewing on Skype. There's a really famous tech YouTuber right now. Um, his name is MKBHD. He goes by Marquez Brownlee. I've been watching this guy since 2011, but he's been putting out videos since like 2008. He is now basically the top tech reviewer on YouTube. Um, yeah. You know, he and when he first started off, he was using the camera – on his laptop, literally as screenshots, you know, to teach people how to do <laughs> things on a computer. And then from there, yeah. he started to he started to upgrade to using his really bad cell phone. And then from there, now, you know, I mean, there are so if if anybody out there listening right now knows how YouTube is with the tech review, like it is extremely hard to differentiate yourself nowadays. And for him to be known as the top guy, he's only twenty four or twenty five. You know, you, but I remember watching him go and yeah. just like I said before, just watching him very, you know, watch him go from a, a process of, you know, I'm sure he'd be embarrassed to see his videos back then. But like I was I bought in and then like I see like on a yearly basis or even on a monthly basis. Oh, OK, now he's got a better intro and now he's got better camera or now he's getting, you know, he's getting asked to go to, you know, Apple events and Google events and all these different things. Like, oh, wow, it's great. I'm bought into his community. And, uh, you know, it's a phenomenal thing to to see that process. And I feel like, you know, now is my turn, and I'm sure you'll feel the same way, and I'm, I'm sure you're already doing it, where you just feel like, you know what, there's something else I need to add to these things. Let's do it. Yeah, you know, the, the the hardest part for me, and, and, and I know you suffer from the same problem because I heard you say it one time, I'm a perfectionist. I want perfect audio. I want perfect, you know, website. I want perfect screenshots. I want, You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. and I'm so far from that, you know, I, and I, I went from not knowing anything about recording audio to learning about mics, boom mics, shotgun mics, pop, pop screens, um, you know, amplify, amplification, noise, everything, noise reduction, I, you know, working on, um, audacity, it was like, whoa, whoa, I don't, I don't want to become a sound engineer, <laughs> you know? But I want right. my mm-hmm. but I want my podcast to sound better than it sounds. So I, I invested in different mics and different situations. And none of it's worked out yet, so I'm still. But I'm not letting that slow me down. Oh, I love it. That's the part that I want to hear. Yep, you're absolutely right. I mean, I I really wish I could do 
you know, especially after seeing Lewis's set up and talking to T- uh, Tiffany, it, it, his, uh, Tiffany does all the uh, visual and, and editing on all the podcast episodes. And I was talking to her and uh, my friends with her on Instagram and we talked a little bit. And I'm, I'm like, you know, she, she wants it to be perfect, you know, and that's, that's where I want it. But obviously I don't have a, a four person crew yet. <laughs> You're right. So, but eventually you will, you know, eventually you will, you know, and, who knows? Who knows where it's going to take you? That's why I tell my wife. You know, yeah. I, I coached sports for for many many years while my daughters were growing up. It was kind of my hobby, and you know, now that they're older and I'm not coaching anymore, it's kind of like what what am I going to do with my time? Like, do you ever think back? Like, what did you do with all the time you had before you started your podcast? <laughs> That's a good point. Yep, I, I you know I think about it. and I feel like I wasted a lot of time. You know, right. and um, now to, and you know, like you. I mean, I'm, I have a son now. He's 19 months and, you know, trying to be able to fit that in in between sleep time and bath time and, you know, feeding time and trying to do it, at po- you know, when you work and, you know, I'm at work and can I do it in between cases or what have you. You just realize how much time you actually have in the day and yeah. how to become that much more efficient, you know, in what you do. I, I agree with you. I think we, we oftentimes, we don't know we're wasting your time. You know, um, but it's it, it really is if you're able to kind of audit it before it's too late, you realize that you really have a significant amount of time that you can get some work done. But, uh, and I'll tell you, the, the the real reason behind why I'm doing the podcast thing was, you know, after selling goods for 30 years, I've sold cabinets, I've sold clothes, I've sold commercial real estate, been in sales and management for the last 30 years. And, you know, when when the day comes – when I pass away, what have I left behind? You know, and it's kind of the legacy issue. You know, so am I, I, I look at it going, if, if I can start up a podcast and it, it reaches a thousand people, well, that's a thousand, you've just affected a thousand people from, literally from around the world with a positive message and, and, and doing something. That's That's bigger than just teaching 15 kids you know, soccer or, or lacrosse or whatever. Well, so. I think that's a really powerful statement. It's a really powerful statement. It's funny. I think we're, we're a lot more kindred in spirit than, you know, we initially, than I initially thought. Like, I think the same way. Like, when I, if I was to die today or, you know, when I leave the earth, like, what's going to be my legacy, right? And I look yeah. at it not from a perspective of how many people I've touched, but actually what can my son learn about me if I was to leave the earth today, right? And the the we the way how I got into this thinking is there's a famous YouTuber right now. I love YouTube, if you can tell. <laughs> there's a famous <laughs> YouTuber. His name is Casey Neistat. I don't know if you've ever yep. heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he'd be he'd be great on your show, actually. Um, but Casey, there'd be Neistat, a lot of great people. <laughs> yeah, it's got to yeah, get there. Casey, well, Casey, talk about traveling. <laughs> um, you know, and Casey, I really loved his daily vlogs just because I just. I just never had that experience before. It was just fascinating his life, right? It's real fascinating how he's able to live this life and then still find time to not only just have that life, but like record it, edit it, and have it ready by the next morning. That's yeah. the part is just like, how do you do that, right? But I was talking to my wife. I was like, literally, you know, I don't wish any ill will on him at all, but literally, like, he has a very young daughter. Like, if something were to happen to him, she literally could learn everything about her father yeah. through all of his videos. And I think that's phenomenal, right? And that's kind of how I thought about it with my pocket. I was like, well, if I was to something were to happen to me, God forbid, like, yeah. you know, I wonder if my son would be able to learn about me through my podcast episodes. And not you know, the seventy-year-old, not the seventy-year-old me, but the forty-year-old me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's it's pretty interesting that you brought up that that concept. Well, and, and like I said, you know, my my, my youngest daughter um, has aspirations to make a documentary film, and uh, she graduated in screenwriting and and doing all that. And and like I said, she, she her first job out of high school ever in her whole life was working as a uh, social media content person for um, Jared Leto, the actor. And um, and, she, and he has a band called Thirty Seconds to Mars. And so she got to run the social media content for for some of his page while they went on tour with Lincoln Park. Wow. Cool. Really? First, cool. Cool. First job. And, uh, this was back when he was, when he won the, um, the Oscar, the, uh, for Dallas Buyers Club. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and, 
And so there are paparazzi outside the office and all that. And she had to be, my daughter at 18, 19, had to be walked out to her car so paparazzi would leave her alone. And, you know, so <laughs> she, had, she had that kind of experience. And I keep telling her, you know, she, she writes music and she does this and that. And I'm like, just keep doing it. I got the hell. And so now I here I am telling her, keep doing it, this and that. And then, I'll, you know, how can I not follow through with my podcast? True. Yeah, that's like, a really good point. <laughs> am, really am, I good just point. Talk, am I just talking out of my ass and saying what a dad's supposed to say or am right. I walking the walk? Mm-hmm. So she sees it. She actually helped. Uh, she actually designed my my website, and uh, we're still working on it. But you know, and she's still she she has a job and she's helping me out. But it's it's what are you leaving behind? That's mm-hmm. that's I always my my thing. So hard to... I, 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 I think children and, and and having a wife is a powerful thing for 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 people to or a spouse, not just a wife. But that's that's my my frame of reference. But um, you know, having a spouse and the, the, that that desire to want to leave something better behind for your for your friends and family. So, yeah, oh, it's it's I been a powerful point. And you know, and, and I can't wait. You know, I get to travel to my work already. You know, I'm flying to Denver. On, I'll be in Denver for eight days starting on Sunday. But um, oh, well, okay. So I, I already get to travel, but I'm, I'm you know. Where's the podcast going to take me? You know, do I get to travel as as a reviewer? You know, am I going to write more? Am I going to write a book about my travels and about the travels of my other people? And my, you know, who knows? I don't. I have no idea where this is going to end up. That's probably the, well. I tell you right now, the one thing you don't have to worry about is content because you got all these different, you know, people who you interviewed in the past. You know, you got twenty five, you know, people who you've interviewed and just great content. You could write a book off of that. You know, and, and the next guy. Uh, the guy named John McCune, he's um, he was in a band called the Nitty Ditty, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, um, back in the '60s and '70s, um, country music, Grammy Award winning producer, just agreed to be on my show, and I'm like, why is he agreeing to be on my show? And it, it's the whole. I'm not so I now I don't get worried about it, you know. Now now I just ask him and see what happens. It's a great feeling. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great feeling. look at the people you've got to interview. I mean, why else would these people want to talk to you unless you had the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, um, yeah, you're right. It's, 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 oh man, it's, I wish if the audience could understand, um, and I'm sure they do. And I'm sure you get it too. It's just like, if they understood where we were at like two years ago or three years ago, oh, you yeah. know, and if, to be honest, if they understand how it is, like even right before the phone call, you know, <laughs> you just kind of make it till you, you, you fake it till you make it. Right. And, um, you know, and then just the ability to kind of talk to these people. And then once you talk to them, like you said, it's just like, man, they're just like regular people. It's just that, you know, they're just highly successful, you know, and, um, you know, I just really hope do. that. Say again. They're, they're successful at what they do, whether it's magic, yeah, they're successful. Me, whether it's magic, you know, for you, whether it's the guy, the the, the white coat, coat investor or the, the Grey's Anatomy writer and all these other type of people that you've interviewed, you know, it, it's being just, I, you know, you, you hear that the, you you're, you are the sum of the five people you're closest to around. And if, if you don't have a good five people, get, you know, find five people. You know, so that's yeah. why I would say, you know, listen to Lewis Howes or Gary Vaynerchuk or Anthony Robbins or Mel Robbins or whoever you want to listen to, you know, Eric Thomas, I, I don't know if you've ever heard Eric, Eric oh, Thomas. Oh, yeah, the hip-hop doc, yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that guy, like, my wife's from Detroit. She was born and raised in Detroit, and that's where he's from. So she gets a lot of the references, and we're just like, that guy's just, he's just a normal guy, you know, that, that got recorded and, and had some, some very uh, – Lucky circumstances happen to him, you know, to get where he's at, and then no, a, a crap ton of hard work, you know, going to college. And- you know, I, it's 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 I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and you know, the one thing that I definitely wanted to before you you moved on to your next point, I really wanted to you know emphasize is what you said about you are who you surround yourself by, basically, yeah. you know, the five people that you surround yourself by. That was the concept that we really 
use with our paying off debt and listening to podcasts. We were listening to um, So Money with Farnoosh Tarabi, listening to Stacking Benjamins, Dave Ramsey Show, um, the His and Her Money Show, listening to Lewis Howes, and basically learning, you know, because there wasn't anybody around us physically who was in this amount of debt that we were um, wanting to kind of do more of our career. So we literally, and this is a message to, to your audience, and what I say to my audience also is, like like you said, like if you can't find people around you who are successful, nowadays with the Internet, there is no excuse. Your that's mastermind right. group, where people talk about having a mastermind, like if you don't know them, then that's fine. Your mastermind group and our mastermind group, when I was going through this process of paying off debt and wanting to start a podcast, was the the podcasts that I listened to or the YouTubers that I watched, you know? So nowadays you can have a virtual mastermind by listening to these podcasts that come out three days a week or however often, you know, your favorite podcaster or YouTuber puts out something. Um, so there's, there's that opportunity really to, 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 to surround yourself with really successful people and you have access to them 24 hours a day, basically, <laughs> you know? Well, and, and- it's no different than like if you needed to work on something on your on your car. My my wife needed a new windshield wiper tank uh, replaced on her Nissan Rogue, right? We go to the to the dealership and they're like it's four hundred fifty dollars, and I'm like what? So I go to YouTube. I'd literally go on YouTube, watch a video, we buy the part. It's sixty four dollars on Amazon. Buy the part. It comes in. I'm watching the YouTube video on, in my driveway as I'm taking off the front bumper, and it was a pain in the butt, but I, I, I see it was all labor. But I literally figured it out just by watching the YouTube video. Right, so it just exactly. saved me $400, you know. And it's the same way with this. And I tell my daughters, and, and any young person that I talk to now, I'm like, what do you want to learn how to do? It's all there. <laughs> you know, you can Google, Wikipedia, YouTube. What do you want to do? And it's, it's, there's no excuse. Right. You know, you, you, there. you know, in the eighties, imagine being, I want to be a radio DJ. You know, I'm going to go to Columbia school of broadcasting and, you know, I'm going to start out in Kansas and work my, my graveyard shift and, and move to Nebraska. And then, you know, kind of the Howard Stern's episode, you know, series where you just got to work your way up and, now with the podcast, it's like, okay, record your voice, put it out there, publish it for free, and now it's out there on the Internet for, for anyone to listen to. Right. And you look at someone like Howard Stern, who's obviously doing really well on Internet radio or, what is it, uh, XM radio or something like that. Like, yeah. you literally could start a podcast right now that rivals his podcast or rivals his show in terms of downloading, downloadership or what have you. Like, because, like you said, like, all of those things that you had to do before that point, like, how the heck were you going to get on Sirius TV or Sirius radio? Right. Well, now you do. Now you can you can put out a podcast and you know, <laughs> you know and compete. Now you know it's, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, I, it's the, the, the hot the hot one show for Sean Evan the hot one hot mm-hmm. wings. I don't know if you watch any of his episodes, but he's making more money as a YouTube channel than he would. He's been asked to be on on HBO or Showtime or you know cable TVs has, has come and said hey put your show on our on our channel and he's turned it down because he'd make less money. Yeah, exactly. And, and he would have no control. Tip. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's like, mm-hmm. it's like if, if someone wanted to pick up your, your podcast, but then they say, Hey, well, Hey, me, you know, let's not talk to this person. Let's, let's go more this demographic. And you're like, no, nah, that's not what I want to do. You know what I mean? Right. And he's the same way. He's like, I'm making good money. I get to control my, my, my content. I'm good. I don't need to go the, the traditional route. And Joe Rogan says the same thing on podcasts. He's like, it's the radio of the future because I can say whatever I want on this channel right now. No one's and, telling me anything different. He's, he's, and he's built the credibility. He's built that community as being like one of the first like really big, um, you know, I guess social superstars of, of podcasts. I mean, he was in that first wave, you yeah. know, and he's done really well. So he's, oh, man, to get to that level would be cool. Well, you know, uh, Lewis was saying he's getting two million down, downloads a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. You know, and that's that's a half a million a week. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, hold on, let me wrap my head around these numbers. So you start going to CR, you know, what, what's the CRM? What you know, the advertising rates, and you start going, oh shit, okay, that's that's there's real money there. 
Yeah, it's a yeah. lot of money there. You know, I'm me and myself, I'm like, man, if I can get more than just my mother to download, wow. <laughs> I know, man. Right? <laughs> For me, I, and I've been offered a few sponsorships and ads, you know, advertises, but I mean, I'd make $15, you know? Because, you know, because I don't have to download them out there yet. But so I said, I go, look, I'm not doing it for the money. Let me, let me put it, kick in a few more months of getting my website set up and get my systems set up in place before I, I started asking for money from people. And you've been, you've done really well with some of your advertisements. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, put them in between. Yeah. So it's, it's been, so I, I basically, what I, I found out is that I, if I can give my audience what they're looking for, which is my audience is, you know, they're doctors. looking for <laughs> doctors who, you know, who, who are, you know, doing things outside the box, but also at the same time, they have financial issues, right? Like they yeah. may need life insurance or disability insurance at a very low cost. Then maybe I can be able to be a, a this could be an opportunity for a company that I trust and that I've vetted already, you know, to really, you know, get, get that message out to, to the audience. And it's been, successful so far um the question though now is is what's next right because a lot of these these uh sponsorships are ending soon so what's the next deal like what's the next you know step like do we continue this or do we try something else and that's where the trepidation comes again again but you know i think you know if i could do it when i had really no downloads and now i'm starting to be be consistent with the downloads that i'm getting then you know we'll see what happens but also you know i'm prepared to take it back to the days where we're before where you know, I was, you know, funding it all by myself, you know. So to be able to break even at least right now is something that I'm really um, happy about. So um, if we can go push past that, then that would be even better. Well, I, I, the one thing that Lewis told me, uh, and he told me this at dinner, was he said two things. Because, you know, I, I, I tend to ask a little more – I had more questions per, per, uh, prepared in my head, I guess, than, than the other guests. But – He's, I said, if you had to start over, what would you do differently? He said two things. He goes, video. He goes, I'd be, I, I would have started on the video and gotten that down better, faster, quicker, all that sooner. Uh, he said, video is the future. He said, you can still strip down the audio and still have my, I still have my podcast, but he goes, my, my show is growing exponentially more because of my YouTube and my Facebook presence where they can see me and see the people I'm interviewing. So there are some people that want want to see you, and some people are just want to listen. He said, so I would do video, and so I'm working on that with the Zoom. You know, I'm working on the Zoom stuff. Um, and then he said the other thing was to get a sponsor. So like for you, like you know, if, if you wanted to get a, a, a healthcare partners to be your, you know, the box outside the box brought to you by healthcare partners. You know, that way. They would be because they would. He said they would give you the sponsorship money to pay for your your some of your expenses, mm-hmm. and, and and that way you're not worrying about buying a new microphone or buying a new uh, quarter inch cable or buying a new camera cord or you know buying a new lens or because that would that would help you with it. So he goes that way you can go faster. It would have to be for everything, but you know for me he was like Southwest Airlines or you know any anybody like that. That's in the travel business, you know, to to be sponsored by them, you know, where you get money up front. That would be the ideal. So, man, that that I wish I, you know, I I, I really admire his uh, his ascent. And I, man, when I heard you on that, I was like, man, that's a great opportunity. I would love to hear your experience about that too. And man, I would definitely would have loved to to meet him up close. Also, I met him very quickly up close that podcast movement, which I hope you're coming to uh, next year or this year, I think now. So it's 2019. And um, very nice, very um, uh, warm, genuine uh, spirit about him when I met him. We only talked literally for maybe two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but, like when I met um, Gary like, B. It was the same way. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and Gary was – at the time, I didn't, even, I didn't even start a podcast yet. I hadn't even thought about it. And um, I'd like to talk to him now. Yeah, but you know, it is what it is. It, it, it'll run its course. The the the, uh, the chance to meet and talk to people, like I said, I, I interviewed the the communication manager of the NFL. I'm like, really? I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's like, 
He's, I, you know, I just sent him a message, and he's like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, maybe that's do it next week. I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. You know, so we talk about how he, he gets to go to the combine and the drafts and, and the Super Bowl. And that, you know, his traveling for work is going to Thursday night football and, you know, doing that kind of thing. So, and he, he actually, he said he's busier than the off season because they're doing the combine and drafts. Yeah. yeah. So he's doing I can imagine more traveling they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to own, they're trying to own the, uh, the off season, which I think more and more sports are trying to do yeah. now, right? Is own the, their off season so that they can continue to keep, you know, their, their sport in everybody's mindset. So. You have to now. I mean, you know, you, you have sports or, I mean, NFL is year around now. I mean, it just is. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I, I talked to him. his name's Andrew Howard and um, been with the league for eight years. And he said, I said, you know, when my dad was growing up, the NFL players used to have summer jobs. You know, they'd sell car insurance or work at the local dealership. Cause my dad grew up in Cleveland. And he said, you would see football players walk around at the restaurants and helping you out at the, at the dealerships and all that because they needed a job. They didn't make enough money. It wasn't year-round. They didn't have year-round training. So they had to have jobs in the off-season. Pro football players. Wow. Now, now it's... Now it is. I, you know. I was reading somewhere they were saying that the NFL is basically a the, the amount of GDP or the amount of uh, revenue yeah. that it produces puts it like in the top third of like countries in the entire world. Yeah. <laughs> Think Especially about that. like the Cowboys and yeah, yeah. So there's just a lot of money. But you know, why, why would that communications manager of the NFL want to talk to me if I wasn't doing my podcast? Right. Yeah, you, you got to put yourself out there, right? Give yourself the platform. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I look at it and go, there's not an entertainer, comedian, musician that I, that I can't at least approach. They can always say no, but so far, more more said yes and no, which is just blowing my mind. And uh, yeah, it's the same way with you. I mean, look at all the people that you could talk to. I mean, the, my one of my neighbors is the um, he's an uh, He's not a doctor. He's a paramedic, uh, uh, but he's on set. He's the on-set paramedic for um, TV shows and movies. So, you know, they have to, if they're doing stunts or whatever, they have to have a physician or a paramedic there. That's his job. Wow. Really? So, so he gets to go. He's on set. So he wouldn't be a doctor outside the box, but he's still kind of a cool guy to talk to. Why not? You know? Yeah, absolutely. My next door neighbor, my literal next door neighbor, is a a social media influencer. <laughs> really? He's 19 years old. He doesn't have a job. Me. He's never he's never had a job. He, he gets paid. He has 300 thousand followers on Instagram plus, and he gets paid to give makeup tutorials on himself. Makeup tutorials, you said? Yeah. Wow. So as his boyfriend edits the videos and, and does the audio and all that, and that's what they do every day. He does makeup tutorials, and he puts them out on Instagram and on YouTube, and and the makeup companies literally, and I mean this, I can tell you, they literally send products to him every day for free. Please try this on. If you put it on, we'll pay you $2,000, you know. He's getting paid a couple thousand dollars for a one-minute video on Instagram. And he's a he's a, he's one of the newbies. There are people that are even bigger than him. I'm like, hold on. I have you have two guys it's living in an apartment. World. Yeah, it's in the world. at the beach. Wait. I mean, so they have to be making just a, they have to be making between six to eight thousand dollars a month just to afford the place that they live in. Mm-hmm. And without a job. It's crazy. You know, it's a new age, new world. Yeah, and listening to the Gary B stuff and all that is really, you know, you know, it is what it is. Whether you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 20, it, it's, <laughs> the internet doesn't know your age. It doesn't know your age, and it's uh, it's the ultimate decider. And, yeah, and it doesn't market, care. That's what the yeah. market says. It doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. So there there are a lot of positive things, and and I, I'm hoping to get more travel out of it. You know. Um, it's just like you. I mean, look at the place. You, I mean, I, 
going through medicine, you traveled quite a bit, just going to different residencies and, and all that, different schools, colleges, medical school. And now you're traveling even more. And now you might be traveling for your podcasting, doing face-to-face interviews, still doing your medical stuff. You got it going on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, man. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to kind of talk about it on, on this show. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, this is my, my year is, is, is the year of results, not resolutions. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to continue to kind of push the, the um, you know, push the limits on what I can do. And, and we'll just see what happens. And like you said, you know, when, when it's time for my son to kind of learn about what I've done, I hope he, you know, will be inspired to kind of do the same thing also. Yeah. I- that's so neat that you said that. I mean, your son's 19 months, you said? Yeah, yeah. You got you got time, bro. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's hope so, actually. You know, like, let's, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that, you know, I'm there to see him in his 30s and 40s and so forth. But, you know, at the same time, it's just like, you know, as they say, time waits for no one. But and it's amazing, too, like, to kind of, it's just amazing. Because, you know, the other thing, too, about medicine that I think a lot of people don't understand is, is, you know, when you finish practicing, excuse me, when you finish going through your schooling and your education and your residencies, you're in your mid-30s, but your yeah. mindset is if you're in your 20s, right? Because you've dedicated your entire life to schooling and all these different things that you feel like you're still in your 20s, but like, uh-uh, you're like 35, bro. 30, you know, you not, just started working. Yeah. You just started working, right? So for me, it's just like I'm I'm 40 now, and I feel like literally, I feel like my life is is where I should be if I was like thirty, right? Um, but because I've had to put things on delay, you know, that's how it is. So it's it's very interesting how all of this is playing out, you know. And um, you know, I, but also at the same time, it's I'm forty, right? Like it doesn't matter how how I look at it; it's just you know what the actual physical age is. So for me, I'm just trying to make sure I do everything I can so that when I as as Gary V says, when I'm in that nursing home or wherever I am, there's not this um, the regret, fortunate veil of regret on my face or on my, in my demeanor. Yeah, you know, I started my podcast when I was 50, and I'm 51 now. But it's the same thing. It's like I, I tell my daughters all the time. You know, I'm like, it doesn't matter if you're 50 or 40 or 30 or 20. I go, I'm telling my 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 one daughter to do her own make keep going on your documentary. Yeah. What do you got to what lose? Yeah. You know. If anything, it's a, if anything, it's a resume for her next job. I get. She, her her resume is unbelievable for a twenty two twenty three year old girl. She worked for Jared Leto. She's worked uh, for some of the Kardashian family. Um. So her references are as, as high level as it gets in, in that industry. So I'm like. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, going. maybe she needs to start her own podcast. Actually, <laughs> you know? I, I, I I'm actually going to put her on a on a, on an episode because she got when she got to travel for um oh being a 19 year old traveling on a bus with 30 Seconds to Mars a rock band opening for Lincoln Park traveling all around the United States. You know what was that like? What's it, you know the people she met that that's you know and I I told her at the time. She was only 19. I said, write down the names, write down the numbers, put them in your phone, because you'll never know in three years or five years, you run you run across somebody that knows somebody that met somebody that knows, you know, you never know. And at, the people you're meeting at 19 might come into play when you're 30. You know, in 10, 10 11 years, you're trying to be more successful, and they're already at that level, you know. So, she's 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 got some cool stories. That's all I can tell you. She, she mm-hmm. still is employed by one of them, so she can't she can't disclose too much right now. So she can't do a podcast. Mm, I understand. I understand. The uh, non disclosure agreement is a two hundred fifty thousand dollars fine. Oof! Wow, that's a powerful one right there. For every incident, yeah. And I go, just so you know, Ali, there's nothing that goes on in that house that I need to that, that I think's worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I go, that's that's not that's not dad money. That's you're in trouble money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 if it's twenty five bucks, I can help you out with two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, 
Uh, I don't have that line you around. Better, you, you, you better start doing some makeup on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you better start doing makeup on YouTube and Instagram. <laughs> hey, man. I, can you imagine making 8000 Imagine going back 20 years ago, Nee. You're 20, year old, right? You're 20. You're an under, undergrad at Lehigh, right? Yeah. And someone comes up to you and says, there's going to come a time where one of your neighbors or somebody you know is going to make more money than you for putting makeup on themselves. What? I'd laugh. <laughs> You'd be like, get the fuck out of here. I'd laugh. I'd yeah. laugh. You know, I would laugh. I would completely laugh. I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Um, and this is someone, you're, and you're, remember, like, I, when I was, when I was growing up, you know, the other cool thing that my dad did, my dad, my parents are blue collar, but my dad was just really like, you know, I don't know if you remember the Commodore 64. <laughs> I sure do. Yeah. So I had a Commodore 64. Um, my parents just didn't believe in like a Nintendo or anything like that. They didn't want me to, to do those things. So I had a Commodore 64. I was a nerd. Um, I would literally, people would make fun of me and like, um, I didn't have glasses or anything like that, but people would make fun of me because I was just all up onto my computer. I would be able to play video games through the computer and all these different things. And then around the late 80s, you know, they created, AOL came out with their own, you know, ability to chat with people, obviously. And then, yeah. you know, all these different things started coming out. And I would communicate with people all over the world, right? Yeah. Um, so for me, like, the Internet wasn't anything, like, new, new, right? But to see it transform to where even me knowing what I could do back then in the late 80s, early 90s, to where it is now, like, I never even fathomed this, you know? So like you said, back to your point about putting on makeup and getting paid this amount of money to do this, what? I just thought literally you'd be able to buy pizza, with, you know, maybe in the future, you know, through, yeah. um, you know, your computer or something like that. But I never thought it'd be like a cell phone that you'd be carrying around and you'd be able to do all these different things. And, it's amazing. In some regards, this is great. In some other regards, I get a little bit nervous with my son. Also, I'm like, what kind of life is, you know, is he gonna, you know, have, you know, and you know, it, it, it's very, it's, it's odd. Um, it's great, I guess, for some people because it's like, hey, you know, like, do I really need to go through those? Because remember, like, he may have been the person that you're talking about may have been the person who everybody would have said you should have gone to college, and then they just would have, you know, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gone through college, accumulated all this debt, and just kind of not sure exactly what they wanted to do. And then next thing you know, they're just kind of just living life and just, you know, struggling. Whereas now he's passionate about something, and he's very niche. Um, and now, obviously, like you said, the, the Internet decides and realizes that there's a lot of value to this. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword, uh, sword. Excuse me. I, I don't think it's too much different, though, Nee, than, than – you know, your your parents were probably your, maybe your grandparents when when they remember life without television. They remember life before airplanes. It wasn't that long ago, you know. And you know, I kind of look at it and go, I feel like I, we've lived. I'm 51, so I feel like my generation. You're kind of in there. You're almost there, 40. You know, where, where you remember life before phones, before cell phones, yeah. before before internet. You know, my 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 daughter has never known a life without that. I think probably maybe up until like maybe two years before me. So I think anybody from thirty eight onwards is in your generation, basically. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, you know, just kind of iterating things like, oh yeah, now I heard of call waiting, and you know, now there's this <laughs> internet thing, right? And like seriously, I I agree with you. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, my, my my first job while I was in community college was working for a a software company that made software or we just we sold software for Commodore sixty four one twenty eight and then the Commodore the uh, the Amiga computer. Oh, wow, an Amiga! If I could have had an Amiga back then, wow. They were yeah, they were they were top of the line, bro. Yeah, what's the name of the company? If you don't mind me asking, it, the name of the company was called Comprehend. And uh, when the okay. when the first first Gulf War went out uh, came on, uh, is when people stopped buying software programs that were games basically. So because mm -hmm. we weren't selling the Excel's and the spreadsheets and all that, we were selling all the entertainment games. And the recession hit in eighty nine, eighty eight, 
88. Yeah, 88. Well, the market, the crash was 88. So probably yeah, the and then, so in 89, and going into 90, the uh, the world just changed where people, the independent computer stores were being, this goes back, like Fry's Electronics uh, had one store. And now, and there was no shopping online for products. So you had to go into a computer store. And, the, the, you know, computer store people had to have a level of expertise because there was no Internet to Google things on. Right. So you, you had to go in and talk to the geek at the stores. And so that's where we sold our, our software. Well, the recession hit and, uh, you know, with the war and all that. So our, that company went out of business. And all of a sudden I got stuck and I quit going to college because I was making 40, 50 grand a year then. In sales, and I'm like I'm making more than my professors. So why do <laughs> right. I? Why do I need to? Why do I need to learn how to be in business when I'm already doing it? Well, what I didn't know at the time, obviously, was uh, when the recession hits and and you don't have a job because I mean, we literally within six months we went from a couple million a year in sales to zero. It was oh, just wow. like oh. It was just a complete learning experience, but I was 22, 23, going, wow, what am I going to do now? So I uh, actually started my own company, and uh, then that went bad, but that was all because of a, a business partner that you have when you're 23. So Then I got married, and then then uh, first kid came out, and then, then I started getting jobs because I needed to feed my family. So it stopped right. being about what I wanted to do versus this is what I need to do to to pay the bills and eat. Right, I understand that. Yeah. And now that I don't have that, <laughs> as my daughters are on their own and doing their thing, it's kind of cool to set up the podcast thing where you, you know the potential. Who knows where it's going to end up? Or I write a book right. and I could be I could be a speaker on stage like Nee Darko. <laughs> Hey, I'm still early in the game, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there, but there's always levels, right? Because like I look right. at that and go, that would be awesome, you know, to, to to get to the point where someone wants you to speak on stage. That's just awesome. Yeah, that, that's I, outside I'm, of your it's, realm. It's humbling. Yeah, it's humbling. It's humbling. It's scary. Um, but I I I I leave it to you like this. I res- I I really appreciate you appreciating what 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 I'm doing. So thank you so much for that. And yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just one of those things where you just like, man, I just, I want to get to this part. I want to get to this part. But then also at the same time, it's like when that part comes, are they, are you ready for it? You know, and, um, and that's, that's the part that I think is, is something that I, I'm really starting to explore. Like what you said, you mentioned that, I think maybe about 30 minutes ago, like, you know, are you going to step up? Are you ready for that moment? Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but, you know, are you willing to embrace it? Well, I think you. I think you're there. I mean, it, it, the, the public speaking thing. I think is almost a given for you, me, to be honest. Well, I appreciate um, that. <laughs> just gotta. Why don't you tell my nerves that? <laughs> um, it's, it's, but yeah, you know, it's just one of the things you've got to work on. So, one of the things. What's in? And here's a story I'll relate to you that that I think will will hit home for you. You're a trauma surgeon, me. <laughs> you're opening up people's bodies and figuring out what's wrong with them. You know, I mean, people, yeah. I mean, I can't even, I can't even imagine having to do that. Okay. So I have a friend, uh, he, he played in a, 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 he was a drummer in a rock band, pretty popular band in, in the early nineties, opened with Lincoln Park and played with 30 Seconds to Mars. And he was a drummer. And we started doing jujitsu at the same time, Brazilian jujitsu. And I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was a, a relatively famous drummer. I just knew he was a guy that was about my size. So we would train and roll, and we ended up going to tournaments together. And we went to a tournament down in Huntington Beach. And I go, so so, what do you do, man? He goes, oh, well, I'm a drummer in a band. He's padded, you know. And I go, wow, okay. And uh, I go, what, have you performed a lot? He goes, yeah, we were on OzFest, and we did all these big concerts, you know, that he talked about. I'm like, oh, my God, it's like real. He goes, I'm more nervous. He goes, I'm more nervous about my upcoming match than I am performing in front of fifty thousand people. Mm. And I'm like, what? How can you get nervous over a jujitsu match? It's just the unknown. Yeah, it's true. That's the point. Yep. 
you know, and, and yeah, it's yeah. the same way. It's like you, I talked to my, if I were to talk to my jiu-jitsu instructor and say, hey, are you nervous about going into the match? He goes, nah, I've been doing this for 40 years, 30 years, you know. But would you want to go speak in front of people? Oh, no, I don't know about that. No, oh, yeah, exactly. You're, you're a freaking trauma doctor and you're nervous about public speaking. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it <Yeah>. happens. <laughs> I think it's awesome. But, you know, but slowly but surely, it's getting better, though. Well, yeah, and, and just like, you know, imagine being your, a first-year resident versus where you are now with your experience. Right, exactly. Yep, you're right about that, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I look at when I started doing uh, apparel sales and footwear sales, I sell cowboy boots, jeans, shirts, T-shirts, jackets to retail stores throughout the Western United States. And so I have California and Hawaii. And then uh, I have uh, a major account called Boot Barn. They have 230 stores nationwide. So I have to travel and, and help set up the stores, train their salespeople that are they're starting for them in a new location. I have no problem doing that, you know. But, but I remember nine years ago when I first started, I was like, I don't know anything about boots and clothes. And, you know, I mean, I know how to put pants on, but I don't know about inset, inseams and Leg openings, low rise, mid rise, high rise, denim thickness, qualities, you know. So if I if you would have had me eight years ago say, hey, why don't you go speak in front of all these people about clothing? I'd be like, oh no. Now it's like, yeah, okay, you're, you're fine. I, I was that the first time you ever did a public speaking? That six eight? Uh, no, 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 I, no, no. I've public spoken to well. Um, it's the first time that someone has asked me to come and speak about, you know, my life as a podcaster, trauma surgeon, yeah. all the different things that I'm doing. But, I've, you know, in going through medical school and going through residency no, no, no. and so forth, there's so many different opportunities that you have to talk and people are critiquing you and so forth. But this was the first opportunity that I had where, you know, like, it's really yeah. about me, you know, so to speak, as opposed to the subject that I'm speaking about. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the things I, I, I try and talk to. Um, a lot of my cowboy friends, that they're professional cowboys. I mean, you know, they're making a hundred to hundred thousand plus a year, but they, they don't have any social skills. You know, they don't they don't understand about personal branding. They're literally guys that grew up on farms and threw ropes and got better at it and became so good that they became world champs. Mm-hmm. But most of them don't look at themselves as a personal brand. I was talking talk to Hunter Kier about the same thing. Where I'm like, Hunter, there's Hunter Kier, you, the man, the dad, the, the husband. And then there's Hunter Kier, the two-time world champ. And you need to leverage some of that, you know. And he goes, he, I go, dude, you're a world champ at a real sport. I go, <laughs> you know, it's not like, well, I'm, I'm a world champ at, at flicking the cable around my finger, you know. It's a real sport, and I'm like, but he goes, because the people around him are world champs or the Cowboys, and no one looks at it that way. I go, why do you think people stop and ask you for your autograph? It's a big deal. Mm. Stopping and smelling the roses, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and But he's got to look at himself as a personal brand, you know, in addition to being, a, you know, it, I think it's just hard for some people. You know, I mean, Dr. Nick Darko is docs outside the box. You know, right? I, it, it, it's the having to pay taxes and independent contractor and, and you know, maybe an LLC and doing all these other things that you wouldn't have to do if you were just staying at a regular doctor working in a, in a practicing office. So you, you, you've stepped out. That's going to be awesome, man. I can't wait to see your success. Yeah, who are you, your favorite players growing up? Who was my favorite bass? Base? Yeah. Oh man, definitely it was. Uh, well, Daryl Strobe was was the pinnacle. That's the guy who I really enjoyed um, playing. So my num my favorite number was eighteen. Dwight Gooden, Howard Johnson, um, anybody on the Mets. I mean Gary, you know Gary uh, Car- Gary Carter. Um, I was a big Sid Fernandez fan. Jesse Orozco. Like these were people oh, who, yeah. you know, these were just people who were just in my in my mind every day that I wanted to be like, you know, so, um, but yeah. And then obviously from a football standpoint, you know, I wasn't the biggest Phil Sims fan. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Phil, Phil Sims just wasn't my favorite guy, but, um, you know, from a, uh, you know, 
you know, but Joe Morris. I don't know if you remember Joe Morris. Yeah, I remember was running back. Running back. Yeah. yeah, Mike uh, Mark Bavaro. For me, he's always the yeah, greatest the tight, tight end, end of all time. Yeah. You know, Maybe. I just you know, yeah. you know. So I, I, I number eighty nine. Say again. Uh, I think was it Navarro uh, number eighty nine? I think so. Yeah. Navarro. Wow, you're saying names old school. Yeah, man. I was watching TV at a young, <laughs> at a very well, young I, age. Yeah, I mean, I played football. I started playing football when I was seven. So. Okay. Mid seventies, I my dad and I. That's what we did every weekend. We watched football. And yeah. he, he he always was watch, making me watch as as not just to watch and, and have fun, but he's like, okay, watch number 51, watch number 53, what he does here, watch, you know, for the next four plays, watch number 83 and see how he responds on the on the trail route. He was trying to coach me while we're watching. And uh, so I played yeah. football for 10 years. And uh, and I think that's where my, my desire to be a coach kind of came from. Okay. L- learning, you know, and I think that's where I, I – I, I've been able to to pick up things faster. I, I, I like. Mean, I just think I look at them differently, kind of like you. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. It's, you just look at things differently. You're not looking at them like, oh, that's neat. And you're like, oh, I wonder how they do that. Like when I went when I went exactly. to Lewis's podcast, man, I was I was literally looking around like, what kind of lights is he using? What kind of cables is he using? You know, it's, okay, so that's pain. And uh, you know, why did he do this? And you know, how did he do that? I was asking questions like that. I was like, how can you? Um, that, that 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 room, his show is uh, literally a bedroom. So That's, does he live there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that okay, that would make sense. Okay, because it looks like an apartment to me, rather than an office. Correct. That that the uh, the little space to the back was literally a closet, where where the bookcase is. Right. That was his closet. That was a closet. And he said he was the first couple episodes was my that was my closet. <laughs> like there was like I had clothes in there. And um, he said, so, yeah, when he goes, we've gone through so many changes. And he had carpet in it at first. And um, and then he got rid of the carpet because it was just, it was always getting dirty, just no matter what. And just, it was just, that was, that's blurry. It's for the place. So, I mean, it's smart as a businessman, right? He gets to write off X amount of his mortgage or his rent because it's, it's an office. So it's a business expense. If you take it to another level, it's just like you think about the people that he's interviewing, like they're coming to my house to interview. Like that's really cool too, you know, like like didn't it, he interviewed Kobe Bryant? Like didn't he well, do it in his office? No. Kobe he did at Kobe's office. Oh, okay, okay. All right. I didn't see the video display of that yeah. one. Okay. But I mean, Maria Shriver, I mean, you know, Rick Pitino, they've all been in there. Tony, Tony, Tony Robbins, he did the last one down the airplane, but Gary Vaynerchuk was, you know, did it there. I mean, but yeah, he, he's got a, it's a nice place. <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, it's got a private entrance. It, it's, it's like, it's, uh, it's nice. But I mean, it, it's, it's like, uh, an apartment, a condo. Great view, downtown LA or West LA, Beverly Hills. So. But it's smart if you think about it. I mean, if you're if you're willing to, to to get an extra room to use as your studio, that's a, that's a complete write off. Yeah, smart, smart. And yeah. Yeah. You know, who who would have thought that he had a whole team like that? But I guess it makes sense for him to be able to have a to have the reach that he has. You got to have a whole team. He said that he still makes all the calls for bookings. So he's the one making all the calls to Maria Shriver to Kobe Bryant. He's the one making the phone calls. He yeah. goes, uh, he goes, I, he goes, I don't want other people. To, I don't want people to think I, I don't take it serious. And he goes, I, and, and you know, I want to be the one that, that they have the contact with. He goes, once we get things set up, I'll have them talk to my assistant or my, you know, my CEO and, and, and their people will talk to my people kind of thing. But, um, he goes. He's the one that makes all the initial contacts and, and does all the all the reaching out to set up appointments. Oh. But you know, he has a personal assistant that to, to make a schedule. Hey, you know, get my. That you know, 
my, my daughter works for, for the celebrity and she's a personal assistant. And I'm like, I, that's what I want. You know, when people say, what does your daughter do for him? I go, what, all the things you don't want to do, me, grocery store, uh, get gas in the car, take the car to the dealership, drop something off, pick something up. Some, some, they have somebody to do that for them. And it's like it just frees up the rest of your day to do all the fun stuff. Right. The stuff that you, the stuff that really, uh, that you yeah. can really, you know, get really great return on. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if you don't have to, especially in, in LA, if, if you don't have to go to the dry cleaners or if you don't have to go pick up, some, you know, something at a store or grocery store shopping or whatever, think about all the time you'd have. And to just the, the mental freedom that you would have from all that. That's why I think that. I look at money as that. I don't look at. I mean, I think money makes good good people better, and it makes bad people worse. I don't think oh, money. Oh yeah, definitely brings it brings out it brings out the it makes your personality come out more. Let's leave it to you like that. I agree. With yeah, you. yeah. So I, I look at it and go, you know, if, if you had the money and you didn't have to think about all the minutia, you know, you had a, a, a an accountant to, to to pay your bills and pay everything. You got to really trust them, obviously. But, you know, imagine all all that stuff taken care of, and you just got to wake up and go, what do I want to accomplish today versus what is all the shit I got to do today? So that, that's kind of a goal, to have something that, that you know. It's, it's, so that's how Lewis, that's how I look at with Lewis. You know, and Tiffany uh, said when she started doing his video, she was the only one. She was doing everything, audio, video, editing. And now she has a team that worked for her. She has, you know, two or three people that work for her now, all under Lewis. So it's just like anything, you know. So, but as a business owner now, you, at least in my head, I go, okay. Let's say he's doing two million downloads a month. That's let's say he's making fifty fifty dollars per per thousand episode of downloads. You know, as an advertiser, it's a hundred thousand dollars a month. But he's got to pay taxes on hundred thousand dollars a month. He's got to do quarterly taxes, right? Then he has. Then I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Going. God, look at the payroll he's got. He's got one, two, three, four, five. Six. He's got six people on his payroll. You know, and if they're making five grand a month, I don't know, seven grand a month. You know, yeah, so all of a sudden, and, and, and it, yeah. It, 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 it dwindles quick. You actually start to realize that in order to have what he has to do, he has to be able to bring in a lot of money up to him. Yeah. It, it, it's it, it's just like we were talking about with the, the, the athletes. You know, an NBA player makes $3 million a year. Well, yeah, okay, he made $3 million this year, but 50% is taxes, so there's gone. So now it's one point five. Then he's got to pay his manager 5%. He's got to pay his, his business manager another 5%. He's got to pay his agent 5%. He's got staff, you know, that helps him. All of a sudden, it's, it's not a lot of money. Sounds weird to say that, but you know. no. But it's a, it's. The, I think it's the proper perspective, though, right? You just realize that it's, um, you real like like you just said, it's just it it goes very quickly, right? You just think that they're, just, they're sitting on this pot of cash, and it's like, eh, not really, <laughs> not, not really. Just like you know, really. how many people have you met? And they go, oh, you're a tro- you're a, a doctor. Oh, ooh, hoity toity, big money, right? Oh yeah, all the time. It happens all the time. It happens all the time, and um, you know, the, but you got to remember also. I mean, we're talking, you know, if we're talking like the Marcus Welby days. Then yeah, you know, physicians and surgeons were were killing it. But now we're in a new age, and reimbursements and how much you get paid is significantly um, changed. And also at the same time, you know the Spending habits of doctors, unfortunately, um, aren't the healthiest. Also, um, you know, there's a book that's a, the book that's called The Millionaire Next Door that basically talks about, you know, your your average millionaire is actually not someone who you would expect. Is not someone you know in a white coat or someone with a JD behind their name. It's actually yeah. someone who's wearing jeans and drives a used Ford. You know, so a lot of the the behaviors, you know, that you would expect you know, that a doctor would have actually are detrimental to their financial health, <laughs> you know? So, but yeah, I get that all the time, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident in, you know, in, in, in what I do and, and what I have and, you know, the struggles that I've went through. So when people say those things, I'm just like, 
you know, my mom well, yeah. only knew. Yeah, you know, they, they, we, yeah, they don't know the three hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt, right? Right, right. You know, um, and then to double it with your wife, it's like, and then the expenses, and like you said, you know, I mean, you no longer as a doctor get to determine what you want to get paid. You, the insurance companies get to determine what you're going to get paid. Right. Right. I mean, they're. I mean, yeah. maybe not so much in trauma. I don't know how that works, but you know, if I go to see my doctor, he says, well, "Okay, well, you know, this checkup, the, the insurance company says it's worth eighty dollars. I think it's worth one hundred twenty. I'm only going to get eighty dollars from my insurance, the insurance company. So guess what? It's worth eighty dollars. Right. You know, an X-ray is worth two hundred and ten dollars. Well, the, the fee is four fifty, but the insurance company is only going to pay two ten. They're dictating what what your worth is. That's the that's the bummer part. But, but see, we get we got off on a whole different tangent there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was fun though. This was fun. So appreciate the Definitely time. Fun conversation. What, what's the best way? And, and what's the best way for people to to find you? Um. So the best way for people to find me is to go to my website. The new website, actually, today is the actually today is the second day of my new website. Uh, depending on when this episode goes out. Um, but if they go to www.drneedarko.com, that's uh, D-R-N as in Nancy, I-I-D-A-R-K-O.com, um, that's the way to learn about me. And then you can follow me on all forms of social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, with the handle at Dr. Nee Darko. So you did change that up. Yeah. Was that, was that yeah. A, a calculated thing or? Yes. Yeah, it's very calculated. Realized that I wanted to, I wanted to be the brand more so than just the podcast, and I wanted to branch out to more things than just, um, you know, it, it basically it was the podcast, and then it was just me. And I said, you know what, I need to change it around, and I need to bet more on me. And um, so this is my approach. This is 2019, and this is my way of saying, you know what, I'm gonna bet on me, and um, and we're gonna win. No, you've already won. You work, you're healthy, you have a healthy son. Yeah, I'm very, I have a lot of gratitude. All right, bud. Well, I appreciate the time. It took up way too much of your time, but uh, oh, thank okay. you. Thank this you. Was a great again. conversation, man. I'll be and definitely I'll, stay in touch, man. 